but I don't I really don't have any regrets I really don't I've I've lived exactly how I've wanted to I've tried my hardest every single time I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won or but I really gave it my all so that for me is enough Hello everybody, welcome back to The Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. I'm James. The Australian Open has ended. Proper sleep is on the horizon. It is promised. It is owed to me at this point. <laughs> After 15 days of you, you sacrificing, uh, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> We've got one more week left in our GoFundMe campaign. Thank you to everybody who's donated so far. We will close it on Sunday, February 4th. If you've donated so far $100 or more, you are owed a brand new BodyServe postcard along with two new bookmarks. If you were still planning to donate, there is a little more time, uh, another week. If you've already donated, thank you so much. And if not, thank you so much anyway, because the download is important. Mm -hmm. It is the reason why we give this campaign such a wide berth, because everybody has different considerations at different times, you know, mm. so... If, if this is something that you're planning to do, there's still time. The champions, the singles champions at this year's Australian Open, neither is a surprise, would you say? No, one more a surprise than the other. Okay, but still not but, a surprise. <laughs> we have a Belarusian woman winning the Australian Open twice. That's now been done twice by Azarenka and Sabalenka, about 10 years apart. Both back-to-back -back years. We have Yannick Sinner, who overcame the world number one, the 10-time champion, three top five players in his last three rounds, winning his first slam. Let's start with Sabalenko. She beats Zhang Qinwen in the final in a straight set, rather straightforward final. In fact, the only real trouble Sabalenka had this entire fortnight plus one day was Coco Goff in the semifinals. Arena won all of her matches in straight sets. It was a tougher draw than last year, except for the final. Last year, of course, was that classic... Except for the final last year. Right. The classic final against Rybakina, a really tough match. But this year, starting in the round of 16, she beats Anisimova, who was surging. Number 9, Babs Krejcikova. Number 4, Coco Goff. And then the number 12, Zhang Qinwen. Anisimova, straightforward. Krejcikova looked annoyed. <laughs> at how she was being run through in that quarterfinal. Yep. Uh, Krejcikova knows how to capitalize on a draw that has been decimated. Uh, she knows how to show up and do her job, but she has only beat Sabalenka one time, and she got routined here. This was the tenor of Sabalenka's matches throughout this tournament. A sense of inevitability about it, that the only person who could really stand in her way was herself. And that didn't happen. It looked to be the case again in the semifinal against Coco Goff. Sabalenka up a break early, about to close out that first set, and then Coco fights her way back. To the point where she almost stole that first set. It can be seen in retrospect now that Coco let that opportunity slip. And had Goff snuffed that first set from Sabalenka, things could have looked different. Because the big Achilles heel with Sabalenka is getting her into a position where she can start to tremble mentally. Mm -hmm. And if you don't push her to that point, then it's just going to be business as usual. She's going to be thawing out here with the ground strokes. And there, there's no putting that off kilter. Mm -hmm. Coco's speed and defense can be really troubling for Sabalenka. Uh, Coco came into the match leading their head-to-head 4-2. -head and sometimes in a best-of-three match, you can wait for Sabalenka to sort of go off the rails a little bit. And if you're able to capitalize on, on that, you have a chance. But I want to start with uh, just the sort of the unpredictability about Arena's career that's turned into remarkable consistency. Somebody with her talent and with her physical gifts, it's not a foregone conclusion that that person will win multiple slams. It may feel that way. You know, when we looked at her when she was younger, the way she played was like, oh, she's going to be a number one. She's going to win multiple majors. But that has been said about a lot of people who hit like she does. And so I want to give credit. Well, nobody really hits like she does. Well, 
Okay, but you know, maybe people looked at someone who can hit like Georgie or Ostapenko, or there have been a lot of upstarts in in women's tennis, in men's and women's tennis, who have flamed out, who were supposed to be great. And so what I'm trying to say is that it was not a, a normal path for her, right? She was considered a head case. She underachieved at slams. She had serving yips for a year that were really bad, but still managed to stay in the top 10. She hasn't let any of those blips, any of those challenges that would flatten a lesser player, a lesser person, stand in her way of climbing to the mountaintop. Right. That was like a very flowery way of, of putting it to the mountaintop. Well, that's where she is right now. I mean, she's not ranked number one, but as you said, she's made six consecutive slam semifinals. She's the most consistent player on tour across all surfaces. And it's increasingly difficult to throw her off her game. Mm -hmm. And worst of all, of all those challenges, her dad passed away a few years ago, who was obviously a big part of her tennis. And they had all of these dreams that they wanted to achieve together. And one of those was, I want to be a multiple slam champion by the time I'm 25. And she did it. Like, just under the gun, she did it. It Her career is just so uh, unorthodox, the way it's gone. And even now, as the most consistent player on tour, reaching six straight slam semis, you know, we have these moments in slam semifinals where you felt she was in control and she should have won and didn't. And yet... She's still here. She's a multiple slam winner. It's just never going to be the predictable path for Sabalenka. And it makes it pretty interesting to watch. What makes her different from other players is that each of these setbacks would typically set back another player a year or so. Mm -hmm. Like you have this you have this moment in a slam, you have this setback, and then, okay, well, next year, five slams down the road, here comes the second opportunity. Arena has been doing it. Back to back to back to back. She hasn't let these issues curtail her progress for too long. Yeah. In Roland Garros last year, she loses to Mukhova in a match where she led, what was it, like 5-1? And then we're at Wimbledon, she reaches the semis again. Another player may have, like you said, taken months, even a whole season to recover from a collapse like that. Then she's in the US Open final. Doesn't win it. Back in Australia and she's champion. Beating Coco this time. Mm -hmm. What can we say about her opponent in that final, Zhang Qinwen? Well, this is the 10th anniversary of Li Na's victory at the Australian Open. I think a lot of observers have been surprised that a Chinese woman has reached this level and this stage of a slam already. Right? It, it didn't take super long for that legacy to be cemented. And certainly Li Na was not the only Chinese woman who was achieving big things. We had Zhang Jie, her contemporary, and many other women in the past decade. But Zhang has felt different, right? She's been celebrated as a potential superstar. She gets to this final with Pear Reba as her coach. This is the same Pear Reba who helped coach Coco Gauff to the US Open title. Reba is with Qin Wen now because Wim Fissett left Qin Wen to go back to Naomi Osaka. And now, <laughs> the first slam subsequent to that, she makes the final with Reba in tow. And this is their second go-around as coach people. Mm -hmm. Reba is uh, clearly a talented coach. It it was a fairly dramatic end between Facet and Zhang. She was critical of him publicly and said the decision was certainly not something she would do to somebody. And even went so far as calling it immoral. I'm still curious about the, the translation there. Because uh, it sounds so loaded in English. So I'm sure there was some vindication she felt from reaching this stage. She was uh, the WTA's most improved player last year, right? And then the previous year, I believe she won breakthrough player. It's just very steady progress for her. Despite having service problems. Mm -hmm. She has this hitch that she's developed in her service motion that's less pronounced now, but still jarring to watch. But it didn't stop her from having the most aces on the WTA side at this tournament. Yeah. It looked janky, but then she was still firing aces all over the place. With ease. And they weren't even boom-boom aces like incredible pace. Mm -hmm. Perfectly placed. Knew what she was doing. It was... 
I don't want to say it was comical to watch because, I mean, she's executing her game plan and doing something remarkable about the, the juxtaposition with the hitch and then firing these beautiful aces. <laughs> it, was, it was something to behold. I like watching her game a lot. She has a, she hits with a lot of power, obviously, but and a lot of top spin. Yes, yeah, quite a bit of lift over the net, right? Like there's a lot of clearance, similar to Iga. Uh, her forehand has a lot of top spin, and in the final, she actually, despite losing uh, pretty routinely, she hit more winners than Sabalenka. I I just like what I saw from Sabalenka in her court positioning, like pushing pushing the issue right she was not camping out behind the baseline she was looking to hit big and move forward and a lot of times she was moving forward to an error or you know her ball couldn't even be returned i mean this is not new this is the sabalenka playbook but um, fewer mistakes we named our last episode swallowed whole because the the entire wta draw seemed to have been swallowed whole by upsets and so by the back end of this tournament you have a couple players in particular, well, there were quite a few. There was Kalinskaya, there was Yastremska, there was Zhang, Noskova as well, Kostyuk. There are all these players where, should they have won, you know there would have been a lot of naysayers. Mm-hmm. The typical penny section crew talking about how women's tennis ain't shit. And this is the perfect example why. And how Zhang Qinwen got wrapped up in this was the ranking of her opponents to get to this final. Saying that, oh wow, she had such an easy ride of it. The average ranking of her opponents was something like 80-something. If Yastremska had made the final, if she had won, she'd have been yet another player after Emma Raducanu to come through qualifying and win a tournament. And wow, what, what a terrible, terrible display for women's tennis and the value and worth of it. Yeah. I thought we were past the the average ranking argument because in women's tennis, this clearly doesn't hold water. It doesn't matter because, yeah, Zhang had to beat the people who were there. So where were they? Where was Iga? Where was Jesse Begula? Where was Yelena Rabakina? Uh, where were they? That was the harder side of the draw, in my opinion. And yet, the number two player is the one who had to face top 10 seeds and a woman who beat her in the previous slam final. But it's, uh, I mean, it's just an unfair standard. How can you criticize whoever makes it through that side of the draw? Like, they didn't do their job. So, fair enough. I mean, it's not unfair to say it wasn't the most difficult path to a slam final. In fact, it was probably one of the one of the easier paths. But again, she beat players who beat big players. The seeds just weren't there for her to play, right? Dodon in a fourth round, very unusual. Kalinskaya in the quarterfinal, Kalinskaya had beaten Sloane Stevens. That was a very good match. Mm-hmm. The Kalinskaya match. Yes. Yastremska in the semifinal, but Yastremska herself, right, had beaten Azarenka. She beat Noskova, who was the one who took out Iga Shriantek here. She beat Navarro, who has been one of the hottest players on tour. So, yeah, she didn't face seeds to the final, but there were none to face. We've been watching Chinwen come up for a long time. Right, she's won WTA titles. She's considered one of the big prospects for the next probably decade. Not a huge surprise that she made the final here. How do we get to the final? In the semis, Chinwen beats Yastremska 6-4-6-4, and Sabalenka takes out Goff 7-6-6-4. And before that, in the quarters, I think one of the matches that had the most talk on Twitter was that quarterfinal between Coco Goff and Marta Kostyuk. And when I tell you it was one of the worst matches I've ever seen in my life. People were being mean about it. We probably were too. This is not to disrespect the fabulous players who were playing this match. It was just not particularly enjoyable for me and apparently a lot of other people. It it was just frustrating because... Uh, of course, Coco got through, but you're watching Coco, who's struggling to hit winners. She's not really executing her game particularly well. But it's important that you learn how to win these matches when you're doing a lot of things at a pretty subpar level for your standard. And if you're Marta Kostyuk, you walk away from that match feeling that you should have won that easily in straight sets. And in this match, you saw Coco's grit and her her etceteras come to the fore. Yeah. 
that a lot of these women don't have. As you said, to be able to play with less than your best stuff and still be able to win these matches. I mean, on the one hand, it's comforting because Coco was playing at, what, like 50%? You know, she had barely any winners, especially through those first two sets. And she still managed to make it through and win the third set in a fairly straightforward manner. The third set was good. Mm -hmm. She played very well in that third set. And it bled into the semifinal because her level in that semifinal against Sabalenka was infinitely better. Mm -hmm. Which is where you you see on full display... That tennis is a sport of matchups. Right. I thought that semifinal against Sabalenka was the perfect example of that, whereby you could look like an amateur against somebody ranked just inside the top 50 one day and push the presumptive favorite almost to a third set two days later right. and look like a completely different player because your game matches up so much better with what your opponent is trying to do. What Sabalenka does is take time away from all of her opponents. When she's hugging that baseline, when she's constantly pushing forward, when she's hitting harder and harder and harder, the net effect of that, the accumulative effect of that, is that you have less and less time to play the ball if you're her opponent. Coco's speed, by and large, negates that advantage. And so when Sabalenka rifles a forehand and tries to come in behind it, and her opponent, who is pressed for time, can only just barely get it back. Sabalenka has time to finish at net. When she does that against Coco, the ball is dipping at her feet. Mm-hmm. She is then rushed for time, which is something that you did not see at all this tournament. That was what Coco was able to do to her in that semifinal. It's what we saw after the first set in at the U.S. Open in the final. Coco's speed and mobility is... it's. It's a skill that is just as elite to somebody's best serve, somebody's most blitzing forehand. You know, if you, you, we don't always talk about speed and those et ceteras in a player's makeup as being an elite talent, but that's what Coco's is. And so if she's ever able to figure out the forehand on a consistent basis, if the changes that she's made to her serve in the off-season with help from Andy Roddick, if those stick, if those get better, then that's why we say watch out, because she is nowhere near a fully formed player, despite all of her achievements so far. She upped her speed on her serve by almost, what, eight kilometers an hour on the first on the first serve, but it still wasn't consistent enough in the right moments for it to be fully effective. Great showing for her to make the semifinal. Still tons of improvement that can be made. There was a mild controversy in that quarterfinal versus Marta Kostiuk where her husband was wearing a baseball cap that bafflingly said, shake your cocos, and it had coconuts on it. That uh, a lot of us assumed was a dig at Coco for some reason. What else could it possibly be? Why are you wearing a Coco's hat? It was giving spring break frat boy. It was just it was like boob joke. It's you know? very trash. It, it was just trashy it was behavior. So unbelievably tacky. In a Grand Slam quarterfinal. Are you a grown man? Are you Alexis Ohanian? Uh, ooh. <laughs> but but the thing is, Coco didn't even do anything. It, it's not like they had a beef or something. You know what I mean? It was so unprovoked. And so Coco responds on IG, on Instagram, with an Instagram story saying, shaky shake, after she beats <laughs> Kostya. Yannick Sinner hatched, he snatched, he's finally arrived. We've talked a lot, especially over the last year, especially with his string of strong results at the end of last year, that yes, he was getting closer, but we weren't quite ready to buy in until we'd seen it in best of five. And we saw all of that at this tournament. Yes, I hesitated to say that Sinner would be Djokovic here, a 10-time champion over best of five at his favorite place. I hesitated to say that Sinner would win this major just because we sort of needed to test it. And uh, he has certainly proven that over the past two weeks. Proven it in really devastating fashion for his opponent in the final, Daniil Medvedev. Oof. Sometimes it's so much more interesting to lose than to win. 
Well, as Fantasia said once, sometimes you have to lose to win. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good song. Daniel is, uh, was contemplative in press, but it's, it's just fascinating to watch somebody like him who comes back from two sets down in the semifinals to beat Zverev after having been on court for, what, at that point, like 20 hours? Thank you for your service, because that saved a whole lot of heartbreak for a lot of people this, this weekend. And then in this final, knowing that he had expended so much energy, that one of his matches ended at 3.30 a.m. in Australia, that he needed to go out there and be more aggressive. And he was much more assertive starting that match against Sinner. Well, he he realized that he could not play the patty cake tennis that he and Zverev were playing in that semifinal. <laughs> right. The endless, just bloop, 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 pow, let's bloop some more, bloop, 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 pow. Mm-hmm. And then one shot to change the tenor of the point. And it's like, oh my God, oh my stars, men's tennis, the pinnacle. <laughs> I mean, a 51-shot rally? Come on. I mean, he was pleasantly pushing in the semifinal. They were both <laughs> pushing. They were pushers in that semifinal. Yes. But at that point, going into the final, it's the last day of the tournament, he knows he's not going to be able to outlast Yannick over five hours. And so he goes to a two-set lead. In the second set, he had led 5-1 and let a few games slip away, and things started to feel like they were maybe teetering a little bit. Yannick had a point, I believe, to get it back on serve for 5-4 to re- erase the double break deficit before Daniil closed out that second set. Both sets, 6-3. But at the end of that second set, you could feel that momentum had started to shift. And at that point, everybody online was thinking about 2022. Mm. Because you could see in the match that Daniil had thrown everything at Yannick and they were now completely different players at this juncture of the match than they were 90 minutes before. And how could you possibly see that playing out differently if Yannick doesn't choke? Mm. And then you factor in that by the end of this match, Daniil had played more than 24 hours cumulatively on court at this tournament. For perspective, this tournament spanned 15 days. Daniil Medvedev was on court for more than one of them. That's crazy. <laughs> More than 24 hours on court. And his most straightforward match was against Felix Ojeleasim. And what does that say? Wow. Not great. The wow. only straight set match he had was against Felix. <laughs> right. I have to say, though, for somebody who was in their first slam final, facing somebody who was in their sixth, who already knew how to win one of these things, and who had played the greatest players of their generation and possibly all time, that Sinner's just competitive will to stay in this match was something to behold. It was just truly impressive the way that he approached this. Sure. I also felt that Daniil let it slip in that second set. Mm -hmm. That's where Mm -hmm. he lost that match. And the big joker, one of our listeners, pointed out that Sinner's performance at the back end of that second set is a great example of why players shouldn't let lopsided sets just slip. Because the work that Yannick did to get from 1-5 down to 3-5, point for 4-5, even though he didn't win that set, that changed the entire tenor of the match. Right. It's a momentum thing. It's a match management thing that Novak Djokovic does so well that even though you may not win that second set, you don't want to completely tank it. You don't want your opponent to go in on a high into the possibly decisive third set, right? Because the tendency is to think, well, this set is a wash. Let me conserve my energy and put it all toward the third set. When in fact, as it turned out, there was a lot of meaningful work that would affect the rest of the match still in that second Mm -hmm. set. And luckily, Yannick Sinner was uh, confident enough in his fitness to do that work. He'd spent that much less time on court than Medvedev at that point. He had that to his advantage The match was not a long match to that point. The first set was 36 minutes. The second set, I believe, 46. Getting into the third set, you're fresh. That was not a consideration for Yannick at all in this match. When you think playing a long five-set match in a Grand Slam final, before the tournament, you'd say, well, wow, Yannick would be at a disadvantage against somebody like Medvedev. Mm -hmm. Who's played so many of them. That was not the case. 
Maybe Daniil should have changed his strategy like he did in the first two sets in his prior rounds to conserve mm. time on court. The, the time management of playing tennis was a big factor in this final. Right. And it's a weird position to be in when you're Daniil in the third through fifth sets and you're actually trying to shorten points. A player who has such elite defense who can actually normally outlast their opponents in longer points. That is your advantage. And in this case, he wanted to play shorter points. I don't know if that's necessarily the case by the third set. I think where Medvedev found himself in the third set was a diminished first serve. He was serving Mm -hmm. incredibly through the first two sets. Third set, the serve started to desert him. And you could see that the physical toll of all the hours spent on court was starting to catch up to him. So even though he may have wanted to hit the ball harder and be more aggressive, he couldn't, Mm -hmm. like he did in the first two sets. And something had already unlocked within Sinner to where he was striking the ball much more cleanly in that match. So everything was converging against Medvedev from the third set onward. And by by the Mm -hmm. time he got to the fifth set, he was gassed. Right. It was either going to go one of two ways. He was going to just hang around and wait it out and wait for Sinner to choke. And that just did not happen. There is something so pure about Yannick Sinner's ball striking that the experts, people like who have way more expertise than we do, saw him as a, a potential uber talent years ago, right? They, when he was 16, 17, they were like, oh, this kid is, he's legit. Cahill has said that the, the real great brawl the real great ball strikers, they just have a different sound coming off their racket, and Yannick's always had that. Mm-hmm. To me, that's the Lindsay Davenport sound. The Lena backhand sound. Mm-hmm. Medvedev loses after leading two sets, as you mentioned, similar to leading Rafa two sets to love in 2022. He's the only man to have ever lost two two sets to love leads in a Grand Slam final. Also taking Rafa to five sets in 2019 at the U.S. Open and still losing that in a fifth set. 25 years ago, almost, another Medvedev lost a two sets to love lead against Andre Agassi in the Roland Garros final. Not a coincidence you'd like to to be a part of. The two Andres in that match. Mm -hmm. And Agassi was not a Cahill pupil at that time, but he would be in about four years' time. Compared to 2022, Medvedev reacted so differently after this and this is what i say like sometimes it's so much more interesting to lose like there's poetry in losing he's older he has a child poetry for whom for him for you for us i guess (laughs) i mean it sure hurts for him i'm sure i mean he's able to express himself in a way that makes us feel better about watching him go through that for sure but i don't i don't think that that necessarily means that it's any less painful no i definitely don't think so but Back then, two years ago, you remember, he famously said, the kid stopped dreaming. And he was discouraged by the crowd being against him. And after the match, he was pretty devastated and was just, well, I'm I'm not dreaming. I'm not that kid anymore. I'm playing for myself and that's it. And then yesterday, in a reference to what he said two years ago, he said, now I'm dreaming more than ever. Probably not today, but in general in life. But I would say it's not any more kid who's dreaming. It's me, myself, right now, a 27-year-old who's dreaming. He's just so good. I love that. Mm -hmm. I I saw somewhere in the internet that we were described as being big Medvedev fans. And that was one of the... That was surprising. That was very surprising to (laughs) us. Surprising to us. I mean, definitely definitely not a hater, but I didn't know. I don't know. I would say he's one of the male tennis players that we are agnostic about. To the point where his victories don't annoy us. And he himself Mm. doesn't annoy us. Which is a small... Well, it's a huge victory. If you're to watch any male tennis player these days. Yeah, I don't don't know how to keep up. Like, we were criticized after that... I think it was the 2019 US Open where he was cast as the heel. Like, the heel character. Mm. Yeah. And he was... He felt antagonized by the crowd and he did it in return. And I didn't love it. I really didn't like it at the time. And we were criticized for that, but now I guess we're a Medvedev fan. So the man, regardless, the man oozes charisma. He, he has yeah. something. He brings something to the ball every time. <laughs> Sinner becomes the first Italian since 2015 to win a slam singles title. 
We saw a lot of people saying he's the first since Panetta. <laughs> In fact, he's the first since Male Panetta. Player. Male player. <laughs> not Panetta, Panetta. <laughs> To win a slam title. But yes, he is the first male Italian tennis player to win a slam title since Panata at the 76 French Open. Is that it? Yes. Panata was a bugaboo of Bjorn Borgs, beating him in the quarterfinals. And then Panata beat Harold Solomon in the, the final of that Roland Garros. Harold Solomon was mentioned in Ben Rothenberg's book about Naomi Osaka, by the way. He coached Naomi for a very brief period when she was a youth. Sinner wins the title by beating three straight top five opponents, including the 10-time champion. Which we'll get to. Well, let's get into it now. This is the semifinal stage. Okay. (laughs) Well, the match against Djokovic, to me, was baffling. It didn't follow the normal rhythms that are supposed to happen in a Djokovic late-stage slam match. You're sitting there waiting for the surge. You're waiting for some of the theatrics, and they never came. On that same night, both Djokovic and Zverev went out of this tournament. Tennis Twitter has not been this elated for a long time and felt unified in a way it hadn't in quite a while. Well, your timeline. Sure. Because the Djokovic-Zverev timeline, there's a big overlap there. What is that? I think that timeline's on Truth Social. (laughs) I don't know what they use, but it's. Uh, I guess it's been blocked for me. Djokovic admittedly played one of the worst slam matches of his life. And that is not an overstatement. That is not a player showing sour grapes in a post-match press conference. We saw it. Djokovic yes. played terribly in that match. And I do not think that it had to do with what was coming at him from the other side of the court. Yannick played great, sure. But that was not the Novak Djokovic that we're used to seeing. And we know that he'd been dealing with some kind of illness. Early in the tournament, he was carrying around tissues. Some of his most ardent supporters are out here now talking about, yes, now we're seeing the effects of the virus that he's been dealing with. The virus? What virus, pray tell? Is it a virus that could have been, you could have been inoculated against? No, they said And chose not to? The supporters know for a fact it wasn't that one. Oh, it wasn't that one. (laughs) It's not like anyone's testing for it anymore. Regardless of what it was, it was just a baffling match for me because I expected Novak to, I don't know, like normally if he's dealing with something physically, there are some tantrums. There are maybe some references to what he's feeling. His box was very subdued. It seemed that they weren't even all that invested because it didn't seem like Novak had the energy to invest like he normally does. There was a momentum shift in the third set. He grabbed that tie break and then the momentum didn't stay, right? It, at any time in a match like this, you assume that it is not won until Novak's opponent hits the last ball. You cannot count him out ever. And it just felt like he did not have the energy physically to fight in that match. But to me, the fact that his team wasn't screaming and trying to rally him, that told me that they knew that something was going on. Or that he in turn wasn't screaming at them to scream at him. Right, right. But again, not this is not to take away from what Sinner did, because he could have... I mean, you could easily lose that with Novak playing at a very diminished level. A lot of players would have, because he still has greatness when he is that low energy. Right, and Novak playing well still could have lost a sinner that night. Right. That's the first match on. Another factor is that Novak played in the day. This is a thing. This is a thing. It is in Australia. It is a thing. Because since... Novak played like, what, 15 matches in a row at night. And the times that we see him play during the day, it's it's shoddy. Before Federer's retirement, Roger often got the favorable treatment from Craig, getting seven consecutive night matches. <laughs> Novak, as the biggest star remaining these past few years, has gotten a lot of night matches. But surprisingly, he played in the day against Fritz and Sinner in the semi. Do you know why that's not surprising? Why? Because Duminar and Rublev played the night match that night. Okay. You could not have an newly minted top 10 Duminar playing his fourth round match against Rublev and have it not be the night match. Hmm. So I have no idea if the the change in scheduling, the routine, the heat, whatever, I don't know what was a factor there. It might have been an illness or like sometimes people just have bad days. It he, was only shocking because Novak so seldom 
I mean, across a decade. So seldom has had a bad day. We see aging stars have more bad days as they get older. That could also be a factor. Who knows? Mm. The other semifinal. Medvedev goes down two sets to love to that guy. And at this point, it's like, what the hell is going on? Djokovic is out of the tournament. That guy just blitzed Alcaraz in the previous round. He's clearly feeling himself. Coco Vandewey has picked him to win the tournament. <laughs> Novak Djokovic is out of the tournament now. Who is going to stop him if he's now two sets to love up against Medvedev in that final? Right. With novice Yannick Sinner in his first slam final. It was serious panic mode for a lot right. of... My, I'm right. not going to lie. I was, I was panicked. I was bothered. I was pressed about it. And then as it turned out, karma. Karma came back to get him. Oh, I don't like that at all. So I call this the Kalma match mm. because Medvedev claims that he yelled Kalma at his team after, after he won, not Karma, it's as a, re- a lot of folks reported. It's a reference to the breakpoint fabrication right. where they created this wild false narrative for Zverev to then say Karma to the cameras when Medvedev lost a match. Right, which I don't even like using it in return because it feels like a very juvenile way to view the world in my opinion. I don't mean to offend anyone. I know that's not even being used in the correct sense, the word itself. Sure, sure. <laughs> Mr. English Dictionary, Dr. Dictionary. No, I'm just... Is that what we watched last night in American Fiction? Yes. Dr. Dictionary? Dr. Di- yeah. The point is... The point is... He had it coming, and it was deserved. Indeed. But also, rely on Zverev to let these things slip. He should already be a U.S. Open champion. Do you remember that? Those moments when somebody who thinks they're that girl is met with the moment to prove they're that girl and every time is unable to close the deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I wanted to call out this uh, really cool data visualization, like an infographic that I saw on Twitter by the user at AndyMarshall86. And it's a, a moving graph that shows how far away from victory each player was. So it shows, you know, at one point, Zverev is four points away from victory, theoretically, and Medvedev is 60 points away. And this is theoretically the fastest route to victory. You know, if you won every every game at love. Very cool to see it like that. It also shows you the absurd and troubling scoring system in tennis, where there's no clock, you could theoretically play forever. You could theoretically play one game forever. Infinite deuces. But Zverev at one point was, he was four points away. He was three points away. He was even two points away from victory and did not get there. Delicious. At one point in the fourth set, deep in the fourth set, it was a tie break. Yes. And Medvedev hits this return slice drop shot winner to give himself set point, which he then closes out with an ace. And the look on that guy's face as he's bumbling to the net and then realizes he's not going to get there. And the the realization of just how unfortunate this is, the implications that this has for him, that the set is probably now over. It was one of the most satisfying moments, period. And then come to hear from Daniil that it was an accident. It was a shank return. Right. He said... Basically, he was prepared to hit a backhand. He had to switch quickly to a forehand, so his grip was messed up. And it was kind of a chip shank situation. It wasn't on purpose, but it was perfect. And then, of course, he closed out the set with an ace. But Zverev was two points away from winning the match there. Then realizes, oh my god, now I have to go into a fifth set against this guy that Netflix and the ATP help me set up as this archetypal villain in my story, I'm supposed to win this. Well, he just did not have the charisma, the uniqueness, the nerve, nor the talent in that moment. (laughs) People were panicked, I think, going into this match. And of course, once Zarev was up uh, two sets to love, people were especially panicked. But going into it, Medvedev had won 10 of their last 12 encounters. Zverev started their rivalry very strong, and the the record was only 11 to 7 in Medvedev's favor. So it wasn't overwhelming. But 10 out of 12, 
of the last encounters, and they had never met in a slam. And Medvedev just has so much more experience at this stage. Right. But Medvedev had way more time on court. He'd mm-hmm. shown that he wasn't playing his best. Coco Vandeweghe had picked Zverev to win the tournament. Oh, let's not uh, forget about that. Let's not forget what Colleen picked. And Medvedev, too, is carrying scars of tournaments that he yeah. has not been able to close out. Do not try and downplay the legitimacy of our fears. No, I James, agree. And while I, you slept. I was certainly afraid as well, but I think there was a lot of fear and even resignation fueling those those feelings. The resignation coming from, I think a lot of us still believe at some point this is going to happen. Right. And of course, uh, you know, somebody called us out, a few people called us out, like it's not the player's responsibility to beat this person because the ATP has chosen not to act. But it sure feels good when they do. Right. but It's not that serious. But we are also one of the few people who, over the years, have been calling out the ATP. And we are also fans of tennis. And we also want the players to beat that guy. Right. And we also are allowed to express our opinions. So, (laughs) um, yeah. The other context that we cannot ignore is how easily that guy beat Alcaraz in the quarterfinals. True. True. Because Alcaraz himself was coming off what Pecci deemed one of the greatest performances he's ever seen in his life the previous <laughs> round. And to then lose like that to that guy, it mm-hmm. was, well, okay, yeah, matchups. Okay, I guess. But what does this mean? And then he goes up two sets to love. Right, right. And in the history of Zverev's legal problems and accusations, he historically plays extremely well when he's being trashed in the press or when something bad happens to him personally. It's almost like he's fueled by this uh, resentment. And he's never had more heat on him than he had at this tournament. We talked about that on previous episodes during this tournament. Something else that was different this time around, by the time he got to the, the semis, ESPN was starting to show infographics on screen with a timeline of the assault situation of the court situation with him in the background. Like this was new. Mm -hmm. They'd finally been given permission or gave themselves permission to address this on air in a semi-meaningful way. Right. Previously, it had been a few commentators going off script. Darren Cahill was one of them. Mary Carrillo, of course, has talked about it, not on ESPN. But this was actually institutional. Where they actually created a graphic and put it on screen. And then shortly after that, published a story on their website about what's going on. Now, sorry, you, do, you don't get credit for being over three years late. A lot of people have already done the reporting for years. So great. Great job for catching up, I guess. I saw so many accounts that have been lukewarm to silent in years prior Going off. Oh, yeah. He loses that match to Medvedev. Yeah, now... Like, now you can go on your... a conscience. Victor lap for clicks. The Australian press, as we said last time, has ratcheted up reporting of the story. Over the past few years, Zverev has not been faced with a ton of questions in press. Of course, he has been asked. But it hasn't been overwhelming. It hasn't, like, run him out of the press room, right? The Australian press has done a great job to keep this front and center... Fans of other sports are sort of befuddled as to why this is happening, to how he could be elected to Players Council, be on the Netflix show, which Ben Rothenberg reports is produced in very close collaboration with the ATP. Uh, ben published a story in Slate this week, uh, which was kind of a follow-up of reporting that he had done previously. His first story, which reported Olya Sharapova's allegations, appeared in late 2020 in Racket. And then the second part was published in Slate. Now, that story has been blocked in Germany and in some other European countries. That was referenced in this story. In North America, there's just a much higher threshold for what could be considered defamation. There were two tidbits from that article by Ben that stood out to us. One being that some fans were successful in getting refunds directly through Ticketmaster because they didn't want to see that guy in a night session. Now, when have you heard of Ticketmaster giving refunds? They made their case that, listen, I bought these tickets. 
I do not want to be made to watch that guy who did this, did that, did that. And what are you going to do about it? And they said, well, you know, here's your money back. Mm -hmm. So now Ticketmaster has done more than any of the tennis governing bodies. We've heard tangentially that he has a new girlfriend. That some of you who've watched Breakpoint said that she's featured fairly heavily on it. And in this piece from Ben, we get a little bit more detail about who she is. Her name is Sofia Tomala, and apparently she is a Me Too critic in Germany. And also, her ex-partner, who is Rammstein's singer Till Lindemann, who's had uh, just a go of it with accusations against him, she apparently has not been too pleased with that, how he's been wrapped up in the Me Too movement because of that situation. Okay. She was previously a supporter of the Christian Democrats in Germany and left the party because they were, quote, too woke. Uh, (laughs) I know a lot of folks complain about American cultural hegemony across the world, but some of y'all just love using that American word incorrectly to describe anything you don't like. Again, we've said this many times, but is there a bigger red flag than when somebody responds to one of these articles one of these tweets with quote innocent until proven guilty quote whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty it is it is the biggest it's the biggest it's the biggest red flag because babe i never pass the bar exam i i don't wear judges robes i don't wear one of those powdered wigs there is it's disingenuous always because there's no reason that somebody should have to be on the ATP Players Council until proven guilty. There's no reason they have to be afforded all of these new privileges. That's not what that means. So that that ends the latest saga with that guy. Crisis averted for now. I know some thought Ben was one who was of the opinion that if he had won this tournament, that maybe that would have forced the ATP's hands even more, that that would have brought about some kind of change or ramifications Mm -hmm. i just was not ready to live through that so i don't i don't think so i think it would have brought more attention and that's it yeah the atp has been so far impervious to attention to criticism to anything like that so i think more people would be talking about it and still literally nothing would be done so because the atp has already said that they won't be speaking about it further until the german trial has right ended they've been caught with their pants down because they don't have a policy they have they have no infrastructure to deal with this stuff apparently it's coming but it it doesn't exist now being caught with your pants down would imply some kind of shame this does not apply (laughs) well mm. singles titles arena sabalenka yannick sinner congrats to them what do you think the prospects are for the rest of their seasons uh this is not a predictions podcast. I mean, the I sky, didn't say to predict. I the said sky's the prospects. The, limit. the sky's the limit. Yannick did not go up in ranking at all <laughs> by winning this title. But both Alcaraz and Medvedev have a lot, a lot of points to defend in the spring. So the prospects are good. Djokovic has slams to defend. I think what this has given men's tennis is... Something different, finally, for the first time in a long time. It's a rare occasion. I found the men's side a lot more compelling than the women's side of the slam. And you know how rarely that happens. Mm -hmm. Prospects for Arena? I mean, she's great on all surfaces. You know, Iga is far and away the favorite on clay, but still. Arena's beaten her on clay. I don't know. More slams outside of Australia is what I think. We'll finish the episode with doubles. We watched a lot of doubles this tournament. Yeah. I love to see its placement. And it was available on TV. And people seemed really engaged by the storylines. One of the best matches of the tournament was that women's doubles semifinal. Between Shea and Mertens and Siniakova and... Storm Hunter. Thank you. (laughs) Firstly, Rohan Bopana, at 43 years old, has achieved the number one ranking for the first time. He's also won his first men's doubles slam title. He was previously a title holder uh, in mixed doubles with Gabby Dabrowski, 
at Roland Garros 2017. He's been around forever and has been a much-loved part of that Indo-Pak Express. Remember the Indian and Pakistani duo, him with uh, Arsam al-Qureshi, and finally breaks through for his first men's doubles slam title with Matt Ebden. Bapana has said that he no longer does gym work. He does yoga, meditation, and it, it's working for him to, to have this glow up. It's not just a fluke at 43. You are number mm-hmm. one at 43. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is very notable. I don't want to be disrespectful and say it's crazy. It's it's not to be believed. Can you believe it? <laughs> no, because he's done the work. He's done the work. This is just good for him. I saw him wandering around the U.S. Open grounds. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Very tall guy. I'm sure a lot of people didn't know who he was, but a few fans were like, oh, look. And he was talking to fans and it was kind of, it's always cool to see tennis players just wandering in the crowds. He said over the past few years, he seriously considered quitting. He wasn't winning any matches and cited his wife and daughter as a big motivation. Bopana and Ebden played Bolelli and Vavasari in the final. Italian duo. Simone had previously won the Australian Open men's doubles with Fabio Fonini in 2015. He's 38 years old now. This is not his first rodeo as a doubles player, but you'd never know it based on the commentary in that final. It was, it was ghastly how these men, and I apologize to those men, or maybe not even because I don't care. I can't tell them apart. I don't know whose voice is which. I don't. I can't. Every time I think one is this one, it's another one, but the, it's... You have trouble with the British ones, right? <sighs> we know the Americans. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying I struggle. <laughs> okay. I struggle. That's a failing on my part, and it's not one I'm willing to take steps to rectify. So, <laughs> Point is, they were vicious toward them. You'd mm. think that they did not deserve to be on this court, that they were the worst doubles players that have ever lifted rackets Mm. that it was shambolic that they had made it this far it it was truly wild so much of the commentary devolves into that in singles as well and it's typically i mean what we get is very often the McEnroe brothers chris fowler the american commentators and there's just so much uh like a denigration of the opponents of the big stars it's like, how did they get there? Who are they? How did they flop into this final? It, It's just very frustrating. Mm-hmm. I've seen reports from people on Twitter that apparently Kyrgios wasn't bad as a commentator. Uh, well, that's not what I want to hear. Is this our life going forward? It is. But that doesn't mean that he deserves to be there. Well, and then he got to interview Yannick Sinner after winning... And saying, oh, Yannick, can you be my coach? (laughs) I thought you were retiring. We'll get to that. Okay. On the women's side, Shea Sue and Elise Mertens, they won the women's doubles title. This is a title that Shea has not won before. It is her seventh slam doubles title. And this comes after she had two days prior, or the day prior, won the mixed doubles title. Uh, (laughs) Shea Sue has returned to tennis... She came back in the spring last year. Since then, she reached four slam finals and won all of them. Three in women's doubles, one in mixed. The women's doubles draw, and I wanted to talk about this last time and totally forgot, but just looking at this quarterfinal lineup of that women's doubles draw, you just have so much cool stuff going on. You have the reunion of Garcia Mladenovic. They've been back together for a little while now going out to Kitchenok and Ostapenko, who were the 11 seeds. Eventual uh, finalists. Right. You have Dabrowski and Rudloff, who won the U.S. Open. You have the split-up team of Krejcikova and Sinyakova, the greatest team of their generation. But now Krejcikova is playing with Zygmunt, Hunter is playing with Sinyakova, and that made one of the matches of the tournament, a three-set match in the quarters. And then Demi Schurz has been around forever. Luisa Stefani, who's won a mixed doubles title, I think. They face Shea and Mertens in the quarterfinals. We get to the semifinals, and like I said before, that match between the number two and the number three seeds, Shea Mertens versus Hunder and Siniakova, was one of the matches of the tournament in any draw. Women's doubles is where it's at, and 
Mertens and Xie complement each other so well. Xie being a wizard, a magician, I mean from anywhere in court, but she excels in that pairing at net. And Mertens is able to cover the baseline and do a lot of the heavy lifting from the baseline. Mm-hmm. She's incredible with lobs. The two of them in tandem, what a team. We watched their match against, who was it? The Italian team, Arani and Paolini. Mm-hmm. And Mertens was not great on that day. No. She was just having an off day. And she had decided to go into magic mode and just start really dictating play in that match. She said that she stopped playing singles and slams to preserve her body so she can continue to play doubles. And what that means is that we really won. We won. (laughs) She said she will continue to play some singles here and there outside of slams as long as her protected ranking allows her to. But her focus is to just preserve herself for doubles. This is a victory for us. In mixed doubles, she paired up with Jan Zielinski from Poland. He had made the men's doubles final last year with uh, Ugo Nice from Monaco. And they faced Skupski and Krawczuk in this final, who are no pushovers here. Krawczuk is essentially a specialist in mixed doubles, having won four slams. And Australia was the only one that she hadn't won. We'll finish the episode with a few etceteras. First being the Australian Open bragging about having more than a million fans come through the gates at this tournament. This is in keeping with what we saw from the U.S. Open, which we attended last year. Every day we're getting updates from the tournament saying, wow, we broke a record. More people, more people, more people. And being on the grounds at that tournament while this is happening, especially compared to the year before, I'm thinking, this is this is horrid. <laughs> right. You're telling me this is an amazing thing. Meanwhile, people are standing up for hours trying to get into one match. The Australian Open did something differently this year in that they allowed people in on changeovers with some discretion to the uh, volunteers Mm -hmm. as to when to do it. I guess if it's a more critical point of a match, then they'll hold the line. You mean they'll let them in between games that are not on changeovers? Yes. Yeah. And Jordan Thompson said this tournament is too woke. Yeah. Which was puzzling. I don't know what that has to do with being woke. Uh, Referencing what I said earlier... About using that word for whatever you don't like. Mm-hmm. But what is the end game here? We live in a deeply capitalistic world. And these big sporting events are some of the biggest emblems of that. And if every year the goal is to get bigger and bigger and bigger, are the grounds getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Are We were told that the 15th day, the, the extra day at this tournament was added so that Matches won't go as long. That'd be a better experience for fans. I don't think that that was the case at all. <laughs> they it was still proven did. patently false. It was a cash grab. That's all it was. And so every year it's going to become, we want more, we want more, we, we want more. And who's going to suffer? I love that there's a lot of interest in tennis, that they can fill up these, these grounds, that people want to come. That's great for the sport. But letting more people in is not necessarily a victory. It's not that the interest has increased. You've released more tickets for a less pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. And so the Australian Open releases this information. I write this on the agenda. Within 10 minutes, I start seeing notable media people (laughs) tweeting about it, regurgitating the party line. Wow, what a moment. This is incredible. Incredible. (laughs) And it's just so deeply fill in Uh, the blank. Unthinking. Fill in the blank. No, let's celebrate media rights deals because that's where tennis makes its money yes they make money on the gate the tournaments are bringing a lot of money and concessions and whatever but tennis needs broadcast rights deals to survive and that's it venus announces that she'll be back she's not retiring she said that her sister told her that she could not quit (laughs) and so she will not that's easy for jamika to say on her boat this Venus, you can't quit. You have to keep the dream alive. So she'll be back, allegedly, playing Miami and Indian Wells. I feel like we didn't quite cover the kits and the fashions properly on the last episode because you refused to contribute. I okay. wonder if you have anything at all to add this time? Mm, not really, no. Uh, but a, f- <laughs> a couple follow-ups. I thought that Chinwen's kit was 
simple and lovely. Alex de Menard. Do you remember that one? No. It was the orange top, which I didn't necessarily care for, but he had mastered the short length. Oh, uh, yes. Do you remember okay. that? Very I, good look for yes. him. Yes. There was a notable trend in men's kits for short shorts. Mm-hmm. Even Yannick, right? I am befuddled to this day why Australian men are beholden to the mullet and the stash. Apparently that's big there. The mullet, especially. If you're ever on TikTok and you you come across like barbers, it's always, oh, I've got an unconventional haircut for you if you want to try something new. It's always a soft mullet. Every single time, every single video, it's a real mullet or a soft mullet. Paul Meskel's been wearing the soft mullet. I hate it. I get That must betray my age. I'm like, I absolutely hate this haircut. And apologies to all the listeners who do have mustaches and mullets or women... <laughs> And gay men whose partners do. It's just, it, it's not a personal thing. It's just my preference. I don't have a, an, a great fashion sense or anything. It's just whatever, whatever you like personally works for mm. you. But Paul is so hot. I just don't like the haircut. We did not mention Naomi Osaka's kit on the last episode. And I think we're both... Well, it came and went so quickly. Wow, that was unnecessary. But also, I feel feel like we each have varying degrees of lesser enthusiasm than most about this kit. Does that make sense? Did I I say that in a confusing way? I don't remember the details of it. Well, you told me you didn't like it. I actually haven't really loved Naomi's kits in the past when I feel like most people have loved them. I I I preferred this one. Mm Mm-hmm. I liked it. I just didn't love it as much as everybody did. Everybody Mm. said, wow, what a moment. That's a slam winning kit. I liked it. Okay. I said on the previous episode that I really loved Sabalenka's kit. I've since revisited that. I would like Sabalenka to wear or be given a different silhouette, a different cut. I feel like she's been wearing the same dress in different colors for years now. Just like Djokovic. And then you see how she dresses up in the photo shoots after she wins and she has so much charisma and this uh this white dress that she wore with her with Daphne this time lovely in a totally different way from last year like more demure just a little more conservative than last year's but she has so much charisma and so much personality mm. I'd love to see them dress her I don't know a little more exciting we said that Coco Goff's yellow kit was one of our absolute faves. Her night kit said, well. Wow. Gagged. The night kit was crazy. It was stunning. Easily my favorite look on either side for the entire two weeks plus one. And Nike, do better with Yannick Sinner. You knew he was a contender. You gotta give him something better than that. Right, but it, again, it's the, the dookie purple. That <laughs> Nike decided to go with. it. What can you do with it? I know. And unless you have a, an incredible physique, that's the only thing that's going to even make you want to not pay attention to the Dookie Purple. I guess. I mean, but even someone like Francis Tiafo, could he pull it off? I'm just saying that it was not it. Period. No. I see Nick here on the agenda, and it, it would just pain me to end our Australian episode talking about him. Okay, so I guess we shan't. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that means it's over. Yeah, that, that concludes the coverage. <laughs> if if you really want to, you can. I don't have to. Okay. You can, you're allowed to make executive decisions. Oh, well, I've made a decision. I own 51% of this company. <laughs> you do not. <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing. I understand. Anyway, Australian Open 2024, we've done four episodes you stayed up until 7 a.m a number of times i haven't or or later even in some cases (laughs) or later yes (laughs) i've watched a lot of the tennis on replay let's say that on the second screen while i'm working the next morning it's been fun love australia hate the time difference but it's not your fault slithering craig stayed out of the news this tournament imagine that is that that might be the biggest surprise of the biggest surprise yeah We will be away for a little while, so we'll release an episode before we go. Uh, I mean, we're only away for like a week, but we'll make sure we get an episode out early in February. Do you know how soon that is? Very soon. It's actually (laughs) this week. (laughs) But we do. It's like, what a promise to make. We can't just let February slip away. 
Season 10 of The Body Serve is well and truly underway. Our first slam of the year is done. Hope you've enjoyed our musings. Like we said, we'll leave the GoFundMe open until Sunday, February 4th, a week from today. If you've donated already, thank you so much. If you've donated $100 or more, update your address, send it to us for the first time, or just let us know that it's the same as it was before. We'll get that in the mail to you. Postcard with two bookmarks. If you've been waiting to donate, if you still plan to donate, you've still got time, you've got a week, we are thankful and willing to accept any and all donations that still trick in. <laughs> I don't know, seriously, that allows us to do more in the year. Yeah, yeah. My name is Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. And I'm James at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. You can find everything body serve related at linktree.com slash the body serve, including the link to the GoFundMe. We've put our email address on there now, which had been a shocking oversight for many years. Thanks for listening. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.